Good morning, TOB. Happy Sunday. Welcome to our online service here today. For any first time viewers, just want to say welcome. And for any of you guys who have been tracking with us for a while, I want you to be encouraged to maybe think about connecting with us on a deeper level here. We had someone a week ago go out of their way to say, how do I get connected to what you guys are doing? I found you online. I've been tracking along with you and I want to get plugged into the community. What a win. So it's possible. Just take that step. We just want to encourage you to take that step and say, yes, I want to do this. Send an email, go to our website and, and find someone that you can connect with and we will put you in the right place. That's just what we do. Now we're going to be talking a little bit about pressing on. Paul's leading us sort of to this moment of pressing forward and that's where Pastor Ken's going to be teaching out of today. So we really just hope God's with you. We just pray for a blessing over your week this week, and we can't wait to see you here next Sunday. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never
promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. So uh, thanks for the worship. We're so glad to have people who can lead us in that way. It just fills our hearts and helps us to prepare for uh, what God has to say to us on any given weekend. We're talking about the Upside Down Kingdom, and of course, the title of this series is, If You Want to Go Up, You've Got to Go Down. If you want to go up, if you want something good to happen in your life, if you want to have uh, happen what will last forever, you've got to go down. It's talking about humility. Because if you try to go up yourself then what happens is God is forced then to bring you down so that he can do good things in your life, which is never a pleasant experience. But this is an upside-down kingdom where God is at work, and the way he does things is way different than the way we do them. So that's kind of where we're going. So we're kind of uh, today, or we're in the last segment of this, so we're going to be starting a new series next week. And uh, the, next, the new series is going to be called Fear and Peace. When things are not as they should be, God is where he should be in our lives. Something really, really important to remember. So that's what we're going to be dealing with. But I want to just emphasize the fact that we're going to be dealing with this issue of fear because it's all out there. I mean, you, you folks all feel it in the air and so on, and especially with the election coming up. So I thought it would be good to talk about this right before the election that's going to be happening south of the border here. So these last seven months, as I think as Dan was mentioning, have been stressful, haven't they? Uh, working from home, which for some of you is great. For others of you, you know, you got all this chaos going on. Standing in line, wearing a mask. Like, I'm getting tired of that. I don't know about you. Um, you know, the whole political turmoil thing that's going on in our world at this juncture. Uh, all the back-to-school jitters, you know, kids going back and, and parents wondering about their kids are going to be safe and so on. The inability to travel still going on. Uh, inability now, uh, we're back to not being able to go to the gym or eat out and so on. And then you add to that the concern, well, very real concern. Like, what is the world going to look like when this whole thing's over? Like, nobody knows because it's all new. This is new for everybody, new for a world. For the first time, this had a timeout, a seven-month timeout so far. So, um, so this adds up to stress. And so I want to ask you to think about this. What do you do when you're stressed out? So some people drink. Uh, sales at the uh, um, stores have been going up in terms of whiskey and wine and all this stuff. So some people drink. Uh, a lot of people eat when they're stressed out. So anyways, I just thought I'd pass on to you um, a high-stress diet, okay? So this should hopefully be helpful for you. For breakfast, one half of a grapefruit, one hard-boiled egg, one piece of whole wheat toast, eight ounces of skim milk. Good start, don't you think? Lunch, four ounces of lean broiled chicken breast, one cup of steamed broccoli, one Oreo cookie, just to kind of, you know, help you keep on going, and herbal tea. Mid-afternoon snack, the rest of the package of Oreos, one quart of Kawartha Dairy Moose Tracks ice cream, and a jar of hot fudge. For supper, totally blow it, okay? Two, <laughs> two loaves of garlic bread, one large pepperoni pizza, one large pitcher of Diet Coke. If you have Diet Coke, it cancels out all the other stuff, you know, and then three Snickers candy bars. And then, of course, you have to have room for a bedtime snack, which is an entire cheesecake frozen, taken from the freezer. So that's the high-stress diet. Now, hopefully this will help you to cope with all the stress that's on you all with the COVID thing. It'll maybe give you the body that you've always wanted. It'll probably give you more body than you've always wanted. Um, and it's a good thing we're all fitness people, right? So you can go out and you can run and, and do all your fitness stuff, sweat out, pedal away, you know, your calorie sins. I've actually noticed a lot of people as I've been driving to work, a lot of people running, a lot of people biking. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of trails up where we are, and so a lot of people mountain biking up there and so on. And fitness in particular is kind of a, a, 
a part of the GTA. I don't, have you noticed that? Like, I go to other parts of the country when I do, actually, and, uh, and I don't think that that's necessary in place. There. And, it, and it's, a, it's kind of a generational thing, too. If I would have talked to my parents and said, why don't we go out for a walk, or why don't we run? They would say, well, why would we do that? We have a car, you know? And that kind of figures, okay, what, what happened. But we are not actually the first culture to be into sports and fitness. Back when uh, Paul was writing his books, he was a part of a culture back then in the Roman and Greek culture, very much part of that. That's where we get the marathon from. That's where we get the Olympic sports from and so on. And he uses the imagery a lot. Sometimes, like for instance, when he's talking to Timothy, which was his protege, he said to them, he said to Timothy, he said basically, you know, fitness is good. Going to the gym is good. Working out is good. He said, but you have to make sure that you don't end up with a fit body and a flabby soul. So it has a limited amount of good in our lives. But he knows, he knew something that we all know. Nobody gets fit and finishes well by just doing what they feel like doing, right? I mean, you know, maybe when you're young, you feel like exercising, but you get a little bit older like me. You think, man, I don't want to do this. But you do it anyways because you know that someday if you don't, your whole body's going to freeze up and it's going to be gone. So what that means is when you feel the urge to, you know, just relax and do whatever you want to do, you have to press on. you got to keep at it. you got to go for it and press through the obstacles. Paul talks a little bit about that in this passage we're going to be studying tonight. Listen to what he says. He's talking about this whole thing about following Jesus and what it means to follow him. And he said, I hope I can die like Jesus died. So this is amazing, amazing imagery. Then he says this, not that I have already obtained all this. Oh, okay. Or have already arrived at my goal. Wow, this is super apostle. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if at some point you think differently, That, too, God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. In other words, don't go backwards. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Just as you have have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and tell you now again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, I don't know where you are today. I can't even see most of your faces. But I do know this. This has been a tough year been a tough year for me. It's been one of a kind, something I've never experienced before. You know, it feels like everything has been shifted. Does it feel like that way to you? That it's just like everything has changed, and we're still trying to figure it out. And for some of you, it might even go deeper than that. Like, you might be extremely disappointed. Like, it may not just be COVID. It might be a bunch of stuff that's going on, the financial struggles and, and fear and so on. There's a lot of stuff going on. And here's what I want to say to you you've got to keep pressing on. Like you've got to keep moving forward in life because if you don't, you'll stall out. Now, I hope to fill up your heart and encourage you tonight. That's my goal and all I, all I talk about tonight. Early in this chapter, Paul talks about how midlife he came to a point in his life where he had to give up his whole resume And if you read on on earlier, he basically said that he wadded the whole thing up and threw it away. And he realized, he said, I used to think that this was a big deal. He said, now I realize that it's absolutely nothing. Because you see, when Jesus came and gave his life for us, all of a sudden, everything that religion stood for was gone. He took the legs out of religion. And after laying out his breathtaking vision for following Jesus and everything that he says here in this passage, he starts this section with these words. Not that I have already obtained all this, who have already arrived at my goal. So you think, wow, this guy's the Apostle Paul. And and he's saying, like, I'm not there yet. 
Like, you know, I'm, I'm on the path, but I'm not there yet. Now, you could mistake this uh, for, you know, the awful feeling that you ever have, that you have when you feel like you never measure up. Anybody ever felt like that? Or, you know, uh, sometimes your parents have helped you along that line, or somebody else in your life has made it clear to you, you just don't measure up, like you're never going to do it for me, and so on. But what is happening here is Paul is just being vulnerable. He's basically, I'm glad he did this because, you see, you'd have this illusion of him that he was perfect. And he's saying, I'm not perfect. Like, this is what I'm aiming for. But he says, I'm not there yet. And it's actually a good thing. And I like to hear this because I still face obstacles. I face pressures. I see things about myself that I don't like. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're really cool with everything that's going on. But he says, you know, even though there's all these things in my life, he says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, you remember the story of Jesus Christ taking hold of him? I mean, it was literally like he grabbed Paul by the scruff of his neck, knocked him off his horse, blinded him, and it was like he dragged him into ministry. It was kind of the, it would have been the joke of all that the person who hated Christians the most actually gets called to lead the churches. So he got grabbed by the scuff of the neck. Now this, again, this would have been devastating for Paul because what this said to Paul, I don't know if you remember the scene from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles where they're, they're going along and, and this guy in the other car going, you know, is going along with them. He says, you're going the wrong way. Paul Paul realized that he had spent 35 years of his life going in the wrong direction. And for him to actually believe in Jesus meant that he had to acknowledge that he had been going the wrong way and he needed to start back at the beginning. And religion was not going to be a part of it. Faith in Jesus was the whole deal. Now, when you, reach, when you read about Paul reaching the end of his life, it's, I mean, you read about this in 2 Timothy. And he basically says, Timothy, he says, Timothy, he says, bring the cloak. In other words, I'm cold. He's in the Mamertine prison, which is a horrible place to be. He's chained to the wall there, or chained to a guard, one of the two. He doesn't have anything there. He says, bring the parchments, bring the letters and stuff like this. And then, and then he says this, he says, I'm pretty much alone here because Demas, if you read you know, the, the uh, story of Paul and read about what he was doing, he was always saying, well, Demas sends his greetings and Demas is with me here and you know, Demas is doing this, Demas is doing that. And then he says here in this passage, when you read it in 2 Timothy, Demas has left, he's forsaken me for this world. In other words, he got a better deal someplace else and he's gone. You think about Paul. He'd started out great. He'd been traveling all over the world. And all of a sudden, his world gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And what he pretty much has to show for his world is a few struggling churches out there and about 12 or 13 letters, and that's it. He had no idea that he would change the face of the world over the next 2,000 years. He didn't have a clue about that. Because, you see, in our lives, you see, we tend to think this is no big deal. I'm not, making, I'm not making any progress. I'm not making a difference at all. But all we see is we see a biopsy of our lives. That's all we see. We have no idea, just like Paul did, not of what God is doing through our lives. Now, this is what you need to hear if you're going to press on. Don't be deceived by how small your life seems by how small your accomplishments seem to be. You can't get deceived by that because it's not true. You know, you serve a God and a God who has his spirit in you, and if he can make a whole human race out of a handful of dirt, you know, he can do amazing things. If he can feed 5,000 people with a little kid's lunch, he can do amazing things through you, and you won't see it in this lifetime, not if you're living it right. Now, I don't know what God's plan is for you, but I do know this. If you minimize it, if you make it smaller than he makes it, and if you get distracted by worry, and if you get distracted by making money and trying to impress other people, you will miss what you were created for. And you don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. And there's something else. You're not going to drift into that. You will not drift into God's calling on your life. You will not drift into what he has planned for your life. You're going to have to press on. You're going to have to keep going through the obstacles. Now, Paul introduces something here called trajectory. Trajectory basically means you have to aim high. So my amazing artwork here, are you ready for this? This is just going to be astounding for you, okay? If you're an archer, you know that if you, like, aim directly at the bullseye when you're shooting an arrow, the thing will hit the ground about right about here. If you're a basketball 
star, okay? You know that, you know, you can dribble, you know, the ball. If you can dribble the ball, I can't. And you, if you shoot, like if you were to throw the thing directly at the hoop, the thing would fall short and somebody else would score on you going down the other direction, okay? Now, I play a little game of this every day, and I, I know this seems weird to you, and I'm a weird person, okay? So when I go in and make my tea in the morning, just for the heck of it, I'll go like this, and I'll try to hit the cup. No, oh, it didn't work. So, but you, you see, it's trajectory. If I just throw it right at the cup, it's going to land here, but trajectory means that there's a curve to it, and it has to, if you want to hit something, you have to aim high. Same with golf, right? So you have to aim high, and that's the point. Like, if you're going to accomplish anything in your life, you have to aim high. That's what Paul's saying. My citizenship is in heaven. He says, you got some people who are living, and they're living for their urges. They're aiming low. And I'll tell you, if you aim it easy, if you aim it low, you'll hit it every time. But if you want to do something that matters and accomplish something decent with your life, you've got to aim high. Now, this is true in just about every arena. You know, if you're, if you're 19 years old and you want to, you know, get an education, you want to eventually get a master's degree and stuff like this, you know, then what you have to realize is you've got to aim high for that. Like if you aim at attending every party on campus and if you aim at, you know, like watching everything you want to watch on Netflix and if you aim at, you know, answering your cell phone every time the thing dings at you, you won't hit the goal. You've got to aim high if you want to go over the stuff that you can drop you know, and, and, and let go, and if you want to reach what you're planning to do. Now, keep that principle in mind if you, if you look at what Paul says is the target of his life. Notice what he says. He's pressing for. He says, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So what does that look like? Well, we don't know. And that's the problem, isn't it? See, if you're going through life, you're thinking, well, man, it would be so cool to have this car. It would be so cool to have this job. It would be so cool to have this girl or this guy and stuff. So when you aim at that, you're going to, you know, you're thinking, well, the prize, like who knows what the prize is, you know? I don't know about that, so I'm just going to aim at what I can see. A little later on in this chapter, Paul talks about a group of people who have aimed their lives at a much different target. And I'm telling you, that's what you see a lot going on in our culture. He says, their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. It's just, it's the way most people live, right? It's the scratch du jour, you know? Well, this is itchy today, so I'm going to scratch this. And this is itchy, you know, tomorrow, I'm going to scratch this tomorrow, you know? And it's just kind of the itch du jour that they scratch. And if that's how you live... If you're just aiming at finishing this life, then that's what you'll do. You'll finish this life. But you won't hit anything beyond it, which is what he's talking about. It's kind of the eat, drink, and be merry. You know, it's like, you know, well, we're gonna, I'm going to die someday, so I'm just going to live it up while I'm here. And to live like this is to live like you have no soul. Cats live like they have no soul, mainly because they're inferior creatures, you know. But cats, it's living like an animal, like you don't live forever. And that's what he's saying. You're going to live forever. You better aim at that if you want to make a difference. Now, how many of you think that postponing your calling in life, and that's what he's talking about here, and, you know, it would be a little bit easier if you just say, you know what, I'm going to postpone my ultimate, you know, goal until the last five years of my life, and, and then I'm going to go after it. What did you think about that? Well, the question you have to ask is, do you know when the last five years of your life are going to be? Do you know if, like, when you reach the last five years, are you even going to have the brain power to do it? See, that's, that's why he's saying this is an immediate thing. You have to keep your eye on where you're going because if you don't, you're going to miss it. Now, Paul describes the precise difference between people who, who uh, live their lives based on the urges and how we're called to live. He says their mind is set on earthly things. It's the natural way to live because we live on the planet earth, right? But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So remember we talked at, at the beginning of the whole series here in Philippians about the fact that Jesus came and he established the kingdom, and it's a, it's a whole new country. Um, and that reality, you know, it's a reality that spans all the little fiefdoms in our world, you know, including all the elections that are going on. Like, like many of you, you know, I live in Markham, uh, but I was born outside of Canada. Seventy percent of the people in Markham were born outside of Canada. 
But I'm in Canada now, and so Canada gets the, my primary allegiance. But there's another allegiance that I have that is way, 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 way more important than Canada. And that's my allegiance to this kingdom that Jesus Christ came to, to build. And I'm telling you, the, this kingdom's leadership is <laughs> nothing like the Donald. It's nothing like the Biden. It's nothing like the Trudeau. It's nothing like any of the leaders here because this leader is holy. This leader tells the truth. This leader does what's best for everybody and what's best for me, not just be what's best for him. This is a leader I want to follow. And the leader of this kingdom holds all the power in the universe. It's Jesus Christ. Now here's the deal for us, okay? In a world like ours, you've got to choose. Where's your loyalty? Like, which kingdom is it going to be? Is it going to be itch du jour? Like, I'm just going to, you know, scratch whatever comes along, you know, what feels good for that day? Or am I going to live for something higher and something better, something that is going to, that my life is going to continue to make a difference even after I die? If you remember, the Philippian people were very proud of their Roman citizenship. We talked about that again in the past. And Paul's saying, you know, as cool as that is to be a Roman citizen, and it was cool back in that day, like, if you were a Roman citizen, man, you were part of ruling the world back then. You had all the privileges. But he says, as cool as that is, being a Roman citizen doesn't mean squat when you get on the other side of death. You better decide where your citizenship, your allegiance is going to be. You think about it, you know, we're, we're residents and, and citizens of Canada. We have incredible privileges. We have things that people in pre previous ages could have never even dreamed of having. You look at what we own and what we have and health care and all the other things that we have. I mean, it is a great time to be alive. But you think about this. Are people now in Canada happier people and more at peace and more rested because they have all this stuff? No. Are they more rested and at peace and happy this year than they were last year? No. No because of the fact that this stuff, when it gets right down to it, it doesn't count. I see people who are afraid. I see people who aren't sure of, you know, what's going to be happening in the future. I see people who are scared to death that they're going to get sick and die. There's another thing that is so important to understand, and again, I think we talked about this before. Right now, you are on a path. I can guarantee you, you are on a path. And, you know, and without even being a prophet, I can tell you where you're going to end up 10, 15, 20 years from now. You just look at the path that you're on and trace it out to the next 10 or 15 years, and that's where you're going to be. Because every path has a destination on it. And it's, so it's no big mystery that unless you change the path that you're on, unless you set things in a different direction and press on and take hold of what God took hold of you for you're gonna that's the path that you're gonna be on so the question is what do you want what do you want last week Blair talked to us about imitating you know that we're called to imitate you know Paul and in the life that he lived and in the vision that he had for his life and in the call that he had for making a difference even when it cost him his life so, you know, we all, like he said, imitate somebody. So who's, who do you want to be like? You want to be like, you know, Jeff Bezos or you want to be like, you know, Elon Musk? You know, he's a smart guy and made a lot of money. And Donald, I mean, do you, do you want to be like them? Do you want to be like, I don't know, Kim Kardashian? Do you want to be like, you know, Lady, I mean, what, Lady Gaga? I mean, who do you want to be like? Because who you set your eyes on is who you're going to be like. And living for Jesus Christ can't be like this little secret hobby that you keep, you know, where your friends don't know because it wouldn't be cool and so on, but you just kind of keep it for yourself. It, it can't be this little hobby farm that you have on the side. You've got to decide where your real citizenship is, where your allegiance is, and the kind of difference that you're going to make. And there's going to be barriers to that. Okay? And I'm just going to wrote these out for you. Again, amazing artwork. Are you ready for this? Okay. Barriers are going to be your own imperfections. <laughs> I mean, I have them. I don't know if you do, but I do. You know, I have these imperfections, you know. And it's interesting here, what do you find Paul saying? This is fascinating because he says, the goal isn't being perfect. 
God's goal for you is not that you'd be perfect. He's up there keeping score and, you know, checking under your fingernails, you know, and checking, you know, doing the white glove test on your, you know, on your refrigerator or something like that. He, his goal is not perfection. His goal is progress, moving forward, moving on with your life. Now, so that's what he wants for you and me, and this has huge, huge implications, okay? Because we're imperfect people. Everybody is. So I just thought it would be good for us to affirm this, you know. So you just, you know, uh, I want you to turn to the person that you're watching this with or turn this to the person that you're sitting with and say, you know, you need to know that you're far from perfect. So you just go ahead and do that. Say that to the person that, you know, you're, you're with there. Just kind of exercise, just catharsis. You know you're far from perfect. You don't realize how far from perfect you really are, okay? Now this is the response of those of you who were told that you're far from perfect. But God isn't finished with me yet, okay? So you just say that back to them. But God is not finished with me yet. You don't judge the work of an artist until it's complete. So there we go. This, as I mentioned, this next week we start a series called Fear and Peace. And the tagline on this is God is where he's supposed to be when life isn't. God is faithful. He tells us, you don't have to be afraid because I'm right by your side. You may not see me, you may not know that I'm there, but I'm right by your side. And we live at a time, you know, when there are people who are filled with fear and anxiety, you know, and, and I think we all feel that. And I'm telling you, if your goal is to be perfect, this will kill you. I'll tell you what will happen because I've seen it happen in churches for a long time, okay? You, you either have to, you either have to, you know, say, okay, I'm making progress, but I'm not perfect, or you're going to try to impress other people with the fact that you are perfect, and you'll be a fraud. You'll be inauthentic. What has happened sometimes in churches, there are churches that, you know, treat, you know, preach that, you know, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can be perfect, and so on. So what happens in those churches is that, you know, people have to pretend. So you, or you have to leave. So you're either, you know, you're either inauthentic, you're a hypocrite, and you, you, know, you judge everybody else because it makes you look better, or you have to leave the church and leave Christianity because you're not, okay? So here's the question. I just want to ask, are you making progress? Very important to understand. That's what Paul is saying here. Let us live up to what we've already attained. Like, don't go backwards because you never attain a certain, you know, you don't attain a, you know, a place of growth in your life and so on and say, you know, I'm going to stay here for the next five years. You won't stay there for the next five years. The truth is you will go someplace, but you won't be there because when we don't move forward in life, when we don't press on, then we get stuck and usually we go backwards. There's another barrier that you're going to have to press through, and that's the past. I have one, Paul had one, and so do you. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on. You know, people sometimes fall, you know, on their face and they say, oh, I'm a failure. Well, you're not a failure if you keep getting back up. The only time you're a failure is if you don't get back up again on your feet. That's the, that's the whole growth process. In the original Greek, the words tell us, completely forget what's behind. Like, let it go. Don't stay there. Now, I think there are two aspects of the past that you and I have, and one of them is the shameful past. So I called it the good, the bad, and the ugly, okay? The ugly is the shameful past. This is the stuff we wouldn't tell anybody about, okay? It's the shameful past, and I'll tell you what happens with the shameful past. Satan uses it as a weapon, and he will wait till you're alone, and he will grab a hold of your past, and he will beat you to death with it. If you have somebody else in your life that does that too, that's not a good thing, okay? He will beat us up with our own history. Now, the interesting thing about this is that he's the one that nudges us into it. Oh, yeah, it's not a big deal. You know, everybody does this, you know. You know he, so he, he, there's this byline that goes on. And then the immediate moment that we fall on our face and we do something that disgusts us, you know, and, and everything like that, he all of a sudden whips on his white robe and he points a finger. You filthy, awful sinner. You ought to be ashamed of yourself because he plays both sides of this. Now, Jesus didn't do that. If you hear somebody calling you an awful person, calling you names and, and, and you know, telling you how you're a low life and you shouldn't be a part of this earth and stuff, that's not Jesus. That's Satan. And he's called the accuser for a reason. 
He beats us up with our past. It's his most effective weapon, okay? Um, the Word of God and the grace of God and the mercy and love of God say, it's over. Like, keep on going. Don't let that stop you. Don't let that frustrate you. Because right now, I'm writing a whole new chapter in your life. Sometimes to leave what's past in the past, you have to take some action on it. Like sometimes, you know, you have, to, you have to go down to go up. Sometimes you have to get on your face and say, God, I have really screwed up. I have really messed up things. But if, you're, if you will be merciful and if you will forgive me and if you will help me, I want a new course for my life. And he'll take you up on it. You know what he says? He doesn't kick you around while you're on the floor and say, you filthy person, you ought to be ashamed. Of you. you know, you ought to be sad. You know, he says, okay, like let's move forward. There's another thing that sometimes we leave behind. You know, like, it'd be like, you know, like you have a serial murder, you know, it says, well, you know what? I gave my heart to Jesus and it's all forgiven, so I'm just moving on. Well, you know, there's a part of you that also needs to make things as right as you possibly can. And if you've got a trail of blood in your life and you've, you know, left a trail of people that you've lied to and lied about and hurt and, you know, and ripped off and stuff like that, you, you know, probably if you want to have peace, you got to go and you got to say, listen, I want to make things right. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to forgive you, and they may not. But if you go and if you make things right, then that at least gives you the peace to be able to move on. And that's where Paul can say, you know, I hurt a lot of people in my life. I killed some of them. But I've got to forget the past because I can't live there. There's another part of your life, another part of your past, and that's the good part. Because sometimes, you know, it's our successes. It's like the big, shiny things that we've done. And stuff. I'm such an important person. You, God ought to be glad to have me and his family, you know, and so on. And, and, you know, Paul was the MVP in the religion of his day. And he's the one that basically says, you know, there's some stuff, like there's some good stuff, you know, that you've done. And that's all good. But you've got to let that go, too. Because this is not about you being the big, shiny person. Another part of this is spiritual victories, you know, and sometimes you, we do, you know, people do amazing things, but can you imagine, you know, Mother Teresa going around saying, you got to hear about all the people I felt like I have really made a difference in this world. You know, then you find people who are truly deep in their lives and they don't talk about what they've done. They don't talk about, oh, I gave all this money away, you know, you know what I do? They don't talk about that stuff. So there's some stuff that you just need to leave in the past as well. Now, let me mention another potential barrier and I'm calling this one the temptation to just take a break. You ever met somebody like that? Like they took a break and they never came back? They took a break and, oh, I'm just exhausted, you know, people of God are so demanding, I'm just going to take a break from the whole thing, you know. And so they walk away from, I'm going to go back to church someday, but they never do. And that's a statement that you make. Like I'm too good for these people. And there are places where you, you know, like I run on a regular basis, okay? And I, this place where I run, there's hills and stuff. And if I don't take a breather, if I don't just stop and catch my breath, I probably would die. You know, somebody would be driving up there on their mountain bike and find me laying on the road. You know, I, I, but, so I have to take a breather. But taking a breather is different than just taking a vacation, retiring from serving God. He says, you've got to press on. You've got to move forward in your life. Because God's calling isn't just like for three months on and three months off or one year on and one year off. You've got to keep on going. Um, Paul says all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. In other words, stay with it. Don't go backwards. Don't get exhausted and just, you know, retire. Like some of you, I keep running all winter long, okay? Um, I don't know if you do that or not, but I do. And I'll tell you why I do it. I don't do it because I'm Superman. I do it because I know that if I hit spring, I hit May, and all of a sudden the birds are singing, you know, and the roads are dry and stuff like this, that I, I'm going to have to build up the mileage that I've gained. And, and, and I hate doing that. I've done it, and I'm telling you, I hate it. So I just keep going through. And sometimes life is like that. You've got to plow through, like you've got to stay the course, stay on it, so that you don't lose what God is doing in your life, and so on. And there's something good that happens when you tough it out. God gives you extra strength. You become a stronger person. So how? I mean, how do you keep on pressing on? I mean, is it just sheer determination? No, you get on sheer determination, you'll never make it. 
It's the power of the Spirit of God working within you and helping you. It's the breath of God. It's like when you're running, you know, you, you get out of breath. Well, he's the breath of God. He helps you to keep your breath. There's something else besides God. Did you know that? It's other people. You know, uh, one, if you read through the New Testament, one of the things that becomes clear is this is a team sport. Like, this is not something that you go and you do under your favorite tree out in the backyard. Like, you can worship God, you can pray to God, but I'm telling you, following Jesus is a team sport because you can't, you, nobody has all the gifts of the Spirit. You need the other gifts of the Spirit. You can't do the one and others by yourself. How are you going to go out, and, you know, under a tree in your backyard and love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, help one another, you know, assist? You can't do that. It takes other people in your life. There's another important thing to understand about pressing on and going for the prize and finishing well. It's not just one big choice that you make in your life and then you keep on going. Like, it's not, it's not like coming to a T in the road and say, hmm, shall I go left toward the evil side or shall I go right toward the good side? It's not that. It's like a thousand small choices of character that you make every day. And that's important to remember. How many of you uh, might remember Kenny Rogers, you know, country vocalist and stuff like this? Um, years ago, he recorded a song called Heroes, and it's very interesting, you know. And he says in this song, he says, people don't try to be heroes. And then this, this is the line he uses. They're just doing every day what everyday people won't do. I thought that's an interesting way to put it. Be a hero. It's doing every day what everyday people won't do won't do like they just walk by last year a friend of mine chuck thornton died at the age of 98 and uh, he wasn't the kind of guy that you would pick out and say oh man that guy's got to be a hero you know now, there are some people you know they walk into a room and they suck the air out of the room with their personality you ever met somebody like this you know it's like <sighs> they suck it all in because they're just bigger than life chuck wasn't like that chuck was kind of short you know like me um, and he was quiet unlike me um, he had this, you know, smile, crooked smile. He'd always smile and so on and, and so on. And I never really knew him well. I was about 14 years old, and he came up to me uh, after church one day, and he said, Ken, Kenny, I think at that time was what he called me. Not like Kenny Rogers, but, you know. So he said, you know, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to be your partner in prayer. And I thought, well, that's cool. So I was 14, that summer, I went away uh, to this camp, and it was at this camp that I really gave my life to Jesus Christ. And he was praying for me during that time when I gave my life to Christ. But it didn't stop there, you know? Like, when our family moved away and, and I hadn't seen him for years, he prayed for me while I was away. And when I went on to university, he prayed for me while I was in university. And then when I traveled with this band for a year, he prayed for me that whole year. And he prayed for me when I went back to seminary. He prayed for me when I got married. And he prayed for me when I went into my first church. And he just kept on praying, praying for me and praying for me and praying for me. I saw him uh, a few years ago when my mom died at her funeral and so on. And he came up to me and we talked a little bit, you know. He's still praying for me. He's still praying for me. He retired at 82 in 1982, but he just kept on working. And he uh, found out like when he's in his 80s that he had started making three-wheeled bicycles for disabled people and also for you know, disabled children and for, for elderly people and so on. He's kept on doing that. And you, I was reading about him, reading his obituary, and he just kept quietly making a difference, making a difference, making a difference. When he died, May 1st, 2019, I'm guessing that there was a celebration. People would have never known who were standing around his casket, but the people who had been touched by his life, including me. See, the deal is that he shares in anything that I've ever been able to accomplish because he was the one who was praying for me. He was the one who was there. He's one of these, you know, heroes. I know for a fact that the events of these past seven months have probably hit a lot of you really hard. You come into a time like this where everything changes all of a sudden. Everything changes, like travel, restaurants, you know, going to the gym. All these things change, and it's very disorienting. And some of you are afraid of what the future is going to look like. And it could be that there's been other stuff that's happened that's kind of a byproduct of this COVID thing. And you're feeling a little bit dazed and broken. And maybe you're feeling angry and frustrated that you have a government that's trying to control what you do and control where you go. Lots of feelings coming out. 
But here's what I know. This hasn't stopped God. This has not stopped God. And what you need to know in this time, it's so important to understand, so important to take this into your soul, that he is so for you. That his love hasn't changed one bit. I think you know that because, because that's, but he is so for you in whatever you face, he's for you. He's in your corner. And by the power of his spirit, he's going to offer you opportunities and he's going to help you through this time. And your life will be different, but it can be different good because you've been through it. Because you see, God is always working for the good of those who love him and those who know, know him. And if you're out of breath and out of grace and out of hope, I just want to encourage you, press on. Like, keep moving forward. Don't stop. Don't let anything stop you. Some of you are getting beaten up by some past failure, and Satan is working his magic on you, and he is beating you and calling you names, and he's just trying to, trying to shove your face into the dirt. Don't let him do it. You've got to keep pressing on. You've got to keep going forward. Some of you these days feel like you're not making much progress. Well, congratulations. I don't either. Some days, a lot of times. So let's do it together, okay? Let's walk together and press on. Some of you are experiencing the agony of a failed relationship, and your heart is broken. Like you're bleeding internally. You feel like a failure. And I just want to encourage you, Press on. God still has a plan. Some of you, because of what's happened, are facing a financial mountain, and you are scratching your head, and you are thinking, how in the world am I ever going to get through this? And I would just say, get some help. There's some great counsel out there. God is the God who provides. He's promised that. Press on. Keep on going. And you'll find out that God is faithful. If you're feeling beaten down by life, press on. If you're feeling overwhelmed by the pressures of raising children or having to deal with aging parents, they're worth it. They're worth what you give. Press on. Keep on going. You know why? It's because God himself will help you. The God who created this universe is for you, and he's at work in the circumstances, and he will help you to make it through. And he will help you to be stronger because you've pressed on, because you haven't given up. So press on. Press on. Keep going. Press on. Let's pray. I want to thank you, God, for your power for people who get discouraged. Think of Peter, who was about to give up on trying to follow you or lead anything because of his failure, and you took him aside, and you loved him. And he helped him, and he became one of the greatest people who's ever lived. Think of people who have fallen flat on their faces, and, and you have raised them up and kept them going because they didn't give up and stay on their faces. You have always been for those who feel discouraged, who feel beaten down, who feel like they can't take another step. And I would pray, God, for those who right now are listening to this, and wondering if what I'm saying is for them, that you would give them inner strength in their souls and in their hearts to carry on, to keep on going, and to find the strength that you give to people who will just put their faith in you when they don't have faith in anything else. Amen. We're going to worship now, and then I'm going to go back. I'm going to come back after this song, and we'll close.
So may God go with you. May God give you the inner strength that you need. May you know that there's a purpose in mind, that God created you for a reason, and he will help you to live out that person. Keep your eyes 
where they need to be. Remember the whole thing about trajectory that you have to aim high. And God will give you strength to accomplish what he's called you to do. Amen. Fog always makes it unclear where we really are. It makes it difficult to see what's going on. We can hear noises. We can, you know, see some things. But fog obscures the familiar landmarks of what's happening so we feel disoriented. And fog is a good way to describe fear. Fear usually comes in the darkness of not knowing what's going to happen or what's going to happen next. But when the fog lifts and we realize the sun comes out, all these landmarks, all these things have been there all along. We just couldn't see them. This next series is called Fear and Peace. And the truth is that God is where he's supposed to be when life isn't. Jesus is the light of the world, and he has a way of lifting the fog. He has a way of burning through the mist made up of tiny droplets of moisture that just obscures where we are. God is where he is, and he is able to bring peace into the core of our lives and help us to not be afraid. And that's my prayer, that that will happen to you, that that will be your reality in the fog of life. By the way, where I am isn't mysterious right across the street from the church.